Well, good morning. I hope you had a good rest last night. I certainly did. And um, this morning we continue our discussion of, um, of um, the gospel in Islam. I would like to begin the morning with a word from the scripture, 1 John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hearts have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it. We proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Christ Jesus. We write this to make our joy complete. And we bear witness that the Word has become human and lived among us. And as we see and handle and hear that Word and receive that Word, we are filled with joy. And we long to commend this Word to all people. Um, that's our calling and our joy to commend this Word. Um, and that's the spirit with which we are entering into this seminar. God's call, recognizing with great joy, God's call upon us to commend this word, but also to embrace this word in our own souls, in our lives, that we might be transformed by the word. And as we receive this word, then we have fellowship with each other and our joy is full and complete. So at the concluding session yesterday, we were looking at some of the um, um, portraits of Jesus within the Quran, and much of it is very wonderful. Um, and we long that these portraits of Jesus within the Quran uh, may um, experience fulfillment, the fulfillment that we see within the gospel as we meet Jesus as revealed in the gospel, that the word that became flesh may be received by all people um, and the joy that comes when, when he is received. So that is the spirit with which we are looking at, at, um, at these questions together, commending Jesus Christ, the living, the living word, um, in whom we have much joy. Let us just pause for prayer at the beginning of our day together. Our dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you have sent Jesus into the world, who is the living word. Lord Jesus, we confess that as we see you and hear you and handle you and invite you into our lives, we experience great joy for truly, truly, you are the Word in human form, the life-giving Word, the light of the world in human form. We just thank you. And Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence among us. And we pray that you will open our hearts to hear and receive the Word today as we explore uh, with, in greater depth what it means to walk together uh, as followers of Jesus Christ um, within um, communities uh, where both Muslims and Christians meet and share day by day. So just enable us to hear and to receive your counsel to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Yesterday we were talking about Jesus at the conclusion of our session together. And the conversation reminds me of um, a book by a Muslim theologian called um, Tariq Khalidi, Tariq Khalidi, he is a Lebanese um, theologian and writes quite extensively. And he has this amazing book called Jesus, um, um, uh, the Muslim Jesus. And he describes the Jesus of the Quran, the Jesus of the traditions, and the Jesus of Muslim hymns and songs for a thousand years. And truly, Jesus is greatly, greatly loved as you read uh, that the poetry and those songs and so forth coming out of the Muslim community. And he says some of these songs, of course, were influenced by Christians' hymns about Jesus. 
for Christians and Muslims interact with each other they have for ever since Islam began in the Middle East. And so uh, the Christian love for Jesus, many Muslims have, have embraced uh, those themes as well. But he, um, and it goes on to say that Jesus is so loved by Muslims that it is difficult for Christians and Muslims to meet each other and talk about anything having to do with faith without Jesus occupying the center of the conversation. Um, he says, and Jesus occupies the center of conversation in a way that seems to transcend both communities. In a way that neither community can say, we own him. <laughs> it's as if he owns us. He speaks, he, he, he is present in a way that seems to transcend both, both communities of faith. But he's always there. And it reminded me of several years ago, I was in Sarajevo and um, teaching at the Baptist um, seminary up on the hill overlooking that city that had been horrendously destroyed in those wars uh, between Christians and Muslims. And uh, down in the center of the city, I knew there was the Islamic center. So I said to the Baptist students that I was teaching, a number of whom were from Bosnian um, background, let's go down and visit with the Muslims at the mosque. Oh, no, 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 there's been a war between Christians and Muslims. They wouldn't want to talk with us. I says, then for sure, we should go and meet with them. Oh, no, 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 no. And I said, I beg you, let's go meet with them. If you don't want to go, find a translator, and I will go alone with the translator. So several of them said, okay, we'll go with you. And so we went down to the Muslim center and knocked on the door. The first time, I suppose, ever that Christians had appeared at the door of that Islamic center. And they opened the door and we said, we're followers of Jesus, the Messiah, we're Christians. And we're from the Baptist Center up on the hill. And we would like to become acquainted. We just want to greet you. Oh, welcome, they said. And they brought us in and they sat us in the, in the lounge and they gave us tea and they gave us Coca-Cola and cookies and more tea and more Coca-Cola. And we talked for about three hours. It was a wonderful time. And as we were leaving, they said, come back again, come back again. Christians have never stopped by to speak with us before. And as I was leaving, I said to, to our Muslim hosts and to the Christians, that we were Christians and Muslims together, I said, did you notice this afternoon that as we talked together, a guest pulled his chair into the circle and we could not ignore him. He was with us all afternoon. And they said, yes, we noticed that that was true. Who was the guest? Jesus. <laughs> Jesus occupied the center of conversation all afternoon. And Teddy Khalidi talks about that. He finds that true. And I find that true with Muslims. It is much easier for me to talk about faith with Muslims than it is with any other group. I do a lot of flying. If my seatmate is a Muslim, I can be quite sure we're going to have very interesting conversation and important conversation, and it will center in Jesus. If my seatmate is a Western European secularist, it's much more difficult <laughs> to recognize the presence of Jesus, but not with Muslims, not with Muslims. And why? I think it has to do with some of these themes we looked at yesterday, you know, as Kenneth, Bishop Kenneth Craig often says, Jesus is the mystery figure of the Quran, and there's great intrigue about him. And so there's a yearning to talk. What does it all mean? And Tariq Khalidi says, one of the enigmas is, one of the enigmas is that the Jesus of, Islam, of Islamic piety, whom they sing about and write poems about and songs about, is in conflict, he says with the Jesus of the Gospels. Very interesting. Um, and we talked about that yesterday, that the Jesus of Islamic piety denies the incarnation, denies the crucifixion. Khalidi says within the Gospels, the whole life and ministry of Jesus is reaching forward towards the crucifixion. The crucifixion is very central to his mission. Whereas within Islamic theology, there's no crucifixion. And so the Jesus of Islam, 
that Jesus of the Koran leans away from the cross, whereas the Jesus of the Gospels walks towards the cross. And he says there's, there's, that, there's that conflict. Um, and another reason, I'm sure, for the interest on the part of so many Muslims in conversation about Jesus. This word, and so we just bear witness in that conversation, ah, come and meet him. We've seen him. We've handled him. He is the word of life. And when you meet him, when you embrace him in his fullness, wow, there is eternal joy and precious fellowship. That's our invitation. Now that's sort of a wrap up of what we were talking about yesterday. And we now want now to, to press on. We're still looking at, at topic, at topic um, um, six, uh, eight here, Muhammad and Jesus. We want now for, um, for the next um, uh, half hour or so to look particularly at the role of Muhammad within, um, within, the, Muslim, within the Muslim movement. And as we've mentioned several times, Muhammad is the seal of the prophets. And so Muslims say very emphatically, all prophets are equal, you know, and we love Jesus. Um, he is a prophet of God. I've been in a mosque several times where the imam actually weeps when he talks about Jesus. He says, I love him so much. But then he'll say, all prophets are equal. And Muhammad is the seal of the prophets. And Jesus is not the incarnation of the word. <laughs> he, he was not crucified. And so you see, this weeping over Jesus uh, is, however, in a context in which Jesus is one among many prophets, all of whom are equal. And in fact, when we say all are equal, I think we also recognize that Muhammad, as the seal of the prophets, is more equal than any of the others, you see. For he is the first among Muslims. He is considered to be the perfect example. He is the one whom all Muslims want to emulate, to imitate what he has done. Because th the feeling is that if Muhammad is the seal of the prophets, and this Quran has been revealed to Muhammad, and we want to obey the Quran, how do we know what is the model which reveals true submission to the Quran? What is that model? And the model is Muhammad. And so they refer to this as the Sunnah, the Sunnah of Muhammad, the way of Muhammad. So you have the Quran, but you also have the Sunnah. And the Sunnah is described in the Hadith, which means the traditions. And later we'll talk more about the Hadith, how they came to be and how they were organized. But within 200 years of the death of Muhammad, the Hadith systems uh, were in place. And there was this fixation about getting these traditions about the actions and the sayings of Muhammad, which led to the formation of these Hadith, this, this volumes of Hadith, which describe the way he did and what he said, what Muhammad said. And so that's a separate system of authority than the Quran. The Quran is God's revelation of his will and his teachings that we should obey, the instructions of God and what we should do and what we should believe. That's the Quran. But then alongside is this Hadith system which describes the way Muhammad did it because he exemplifies the way a true Muslim should function. And they look at the life of Muhammad in minute detail. For example, um, um, his favorite wife was Aisha, and she says how that, uh, how that uh, Muhammad would always put his right shoe on first, and then his left shoe. That's within the Hadith, right shoe first and left shoe. So every Muslim will want to do what? Put his right shoe on first, and then his left shoe, because that's the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad or combing his hair. He will comb his hair starting from the right side and then going to the left. So if you want to follow the Sunnah of the Prophet, which as a faithful Muslim you most certainly do, 
you want to comb your hair starting at the right and going to the left, you see. Um, when we lived in Somalia, uh, we would often have people in our home. And occasionally we would run out of chairs. We did not have adequate chairs for everybody who would come into our living room. And so um, I would throw some cushions on the floor, myself sit on a cushion on the floor. And they would say, no, 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 no. And so two people would sit on in one chair. But they would never permit me to sit on the floor. And none of them would sit on the floor. Maybe even sometimes, if the room was very full, even three people on one chair. So I asked my Muslim friends, why? Why can't I sit on the floor when the room is full? Ah, there's a hadith in, regard, in regards to the Sunnah of the Prophet about all of that. And this is the hadith, that there was, I think, eight men on a log, sitting on a log, and the log was full, no more room. And two more men come along. O oh, Prophet, if we are all equal, what shall we do? if there's no more room for these two men who've come along? And the answer is, squeeze. <laughs> you see? Make space for the two. But if you have one sitting on the ground, or two sitting on the ground, and the rest on the log, then that suggests a, 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 a lack of equality. And since all Muslims are equal before God, the way you sit should demonstrate that equality. So if some are sitting on the floor, and some are sitting in chairs, why that demonstrates inequality is not acceptable. So you just squeeze everybody on chairs. So when I learned that hadith, what did I do? If we're having guests coming to our home, I knew we would not have enough chairs. I would take all the chairs out of the living room and we would put mats on the floor and everybody would sit on the floor, you see. But never someone on chairs or a few on chairs and a few on the floor. It has to do with this hadith about equality. Now take note, I suppose there is no religion on earth or ideology where there is a greater emphasis on emulating the actions of the founder than is true of Islam. I mean, with Jesus, we confess that he is Savior and Lord. He is the center of our lives. We're committed to him. But we pay no attention at all to which shoe he put on first, you see. There is absolutely nothing having to do with, uh, with that kind of concern or how he combed his hair, you see, or how he washed his hands before eating. We pay no attention to those sorts of details about Jesus whatsoever. But within Islam, there is this great fixation on emulating the Prophet Muhammad in every way. Why? Because of this great concern to bring all aspects of life under the authority of the Quran. And Muhammad is the one who most perfectly demonstrated uh, submission to the Quran. He is the perfect example, the Quran says. Uh, he is, he is um, the first among Muslims. He is the model that we should follow, that we should emulate. Yes? Is this required to put the just like Muhammad right shoe and the left shoe? And the second question, do they have any stories about how he clothes, and do they put the same clothes today in the modern world that the Muhammad did? Well, yes, to both questions. Uh, certainly, emulating the way of the Prophet is highly recommended. If you really want to submit to the Quran, then you should emulate the way of the Prophet. Now, certainly, Muslims dress in a great variety of ways, um, but there are hadith in regards to how he dressed, you see. And uh, so many pious Muslims will seek to dress in that way. In the United States, we often will see a Muslim going down the street with a long flowing robe, you know. Well, why? Because Muhammad did that. Men often wear a cap. Muhammad wore a cap. So emulating the way he did, you may want to wear a cap. Um, there's a great deal of diversity on how seriously people take those sorts of commitments. But the tug, the tug is always toward emulating the way he did things. That's right. Now take note, therefore, if you criticize Muhammad, what are you doing? You are criticizing every Muslim on earth, for all Muslims seek to emulate the way of Muhammad. You're not just critiquing Muhammad, 
you're critiquing every Muslim. If you have a Muslim neighbor and you critique Muhammad, you're not only critiquing Muhammad, you're critiquing your neighbor, you see. Um, we uh, talked yesterday, the other day someone was commenting about the great fur that developed over these horrible, horrible cartoons that were done by this Danish newspaper, horrible. And um, uh, again, we know that this was not done by Christians, this was secularist non-believers who did this sort of thing. But the, the response by the world community of Islam was extremely powerful. Why? You're not only critiquing Muhammad, who is the ideal Muslim, the first among Muslims, but in critiquing him, you're critiquing every Muslim on earth, you see. You see. So if we have concerns about Muhammad's lifestyle and things like that, uh, we need to approach those concerns with great gentleness. Um, this, this is... Now, now not only is Muhammad to be emulated. But as time went on, after the advent of the Quran and the development of Islamic theology and so forth, as time went on, the doctrine of his sinlessness began to come into Islam. So though the Quran does not say that Muhammad was without sin, the assumption among many Muslim theologians is that Muhammad was without sin. Um, and in many Muslim communities, and we'll talk more about this later on when we, when we talk about Sufism, but among many Muslim communities, he is exalted also to become intercessor. Intercessor. Now, the Quran says there's no intercessor. You don't need any intercessor. You see, that's Orthodox Islam. Um, but the Quran goes on to say, unless God appoints him. No intercessor, unless God appoints him, you see. And so many, many Muslims believe that God has appointed Muhammad as an intercessor. And so they will pray to God and ask Muhammad to intercede for them. And when we come to Sufism, as I said, I want to push out on that a bit more. But that intercession theme is present among many Muslims, particularly in relationship to Muhammad, who is exalted very high uh, in their veneration, never as God, no, never as God, but exalted very high and in fact, for many Muslims, becomes the intercessor to whom they look. TVS is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TVS ministry. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. Now, I'm slipping down here to point four in the, in the outline, talking about Jesus and Muhammad. Um, within the Quran, it is stated that, that um, Jesus prophesied the coming of Muhammad. And so our Muslim friends get the New Testament, the scholars do, and they investigate the New Testament very, very carefully to try to find where this prophecy about Muhammad coming is found. And ah, when they get to the Gospel of John, they find it, especially in John chapter 14, where Jesus says um, that he will send, verse 16, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth, verse 17, John 14, 17. So the Spirit of Truth is going to come, verse 16, the counselor. And then you look over to chapter 16, and there you see also the promise of this coming counselor. Ah, they say, this is it. This is it. This is the promised coming of Ahmed, that Jesus is prophesying. Now, when you look at chapter 14 and 16, Jesus says very clearly it's the Holy Spirit. But our Muslim friends say, oh, this is, this is Muhammad. This is Muhammad. Jesus is prophesying the coming of Muhammad. They believe that's what these prophecies are saying. Now, what many Muslim scholars do <coughs> is to look at the Greek to make their case. <coughs> And 
And the Greek uh, is, uh, I'll, I'll use the Latin script here, is paracletus. Paracletus. Jesus promises that the paraclete, the paracletus will come, which means the counselor or the comforter, translated in different ways, paracletus. Muslim scholars say that in their investigation, they have found that the original word was not paracletus, but it was paraplutus. Paraplutus, which means the praised one. And Ahmed means the praised one. Ahmed is another name for Muhammad. Ahmed and Muhammad are synonyms. Ahmed means the praised one. Get it? So they say in their investigations, they have found that the original word was paraplutus, meaning the praised one, who is Ahmed. So this was a prophecy about Muhammad is what Muslim scholars say. I meet this all over the world in my, in my conversation with Muslims, what they say. I was in a mosque in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania one time, and uh, the imam began to talk about this, how that Jesus was looking forward so much to the coming of Muhammad, and he prophesied that he will come. And then the Christians took this prophecy, and the man began to weep, actually. The imam began to weep. He says the Christians took this prophecy and they changed it to say the counselor. And so they erased what the original text said, corrupted it. <clears throat> now, brothers and sisters, I think it behooves us with all the clarity we know how to express to make it clear that this is not true. The original word was never paraplutus. We have at least 5,000 ancient manuscripts of the New Testament. In all of them, whether you're looking at the Greek or the translations of the Greek into Syriac or Latin, or whatever it is, in all these texts, without any exception, it is Paracletus, the counselor, you see. This was not changed. Jesus never said that the Paraplutus will come. He said that the council will come, Paracletus. And you look at both John 14 and John 16, he goes on to say, by this he means the Holy Spirit. And he describes the work of the Holy Spirit to convict of sin and to convict of righteousness and to bring to remembrance what Jesus has said, you know, to lead and guide the church, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And at Pentecost, indeed, this was fulfilled and continues to be fulfilled in the life and ministry of the church. Jesus is prophesying the coming of the Holy Spirit. And in my conversation with my Muslim friends, I plead with them, please don't do that. Don't corrupt the scriptures. The scriptures are paracletus, not paraplutus. Don't corrupt it. Receive the message of the scriptures that Jesus is prophesying the coming of the Holy Spirit. And I say to my Muslim friends, as friend to friend, I want to speak very sincerely with you. It is never wise, never wise to say that the Holy Spirit is a man. The Holy Spirit is the presence of God with us not a man. And Jesus is prophesying the coming of his spirit, the spirit of God, to continue the work of Jesus on earth. And when you dismiss the Holy Spirit, how can you ever know the truth? For it's only through the truth that our hearts are open to believe. I was in a dialogue in London here a couple years ago. I've mentioned this several times. Um, with a Muslim theologian, and we were talking about this in that dialogue one evening in one of the universities. And he says, well, we Muslims don't know about the Holy Spirit. So you mean we cannot know the truth? I said, yes. You need the Holy Spirit to understand the truth. What shall we do then? 
I said, Jesus said it very clearly. Ask for the Holy Spirit and God will give you the Holy Spirit. Very simple. Ask for the Holy Spirit and God will give the Holy Spirit so that we may understand the truth. But don't, don't, I plead with you, don't say the Holy Spirit is a man. The Holy Spirit is God with us, the presence of God among us. Yes. What sources do you use to try to explain this part, Lutus? There's no source. How, I mean, you say they studied, but what did they study? No, what no they, there, there's no source. There's no source. But, so what they study yeah. when they say, when, when they quote to the study, what they quote to? What it's, they refer it's, to? it's simply an idea that has been embraced. There's absolutely no textual evidence for this whatsoever. Yeah. Yusuf Ali, whose who's quote and I use, I, I, I use at home, I use one with the Arabic and many commentary, a lot of commentary to it. He says, our scholars say, and he is a scholar himself. He just says, our scholars say, you see. But he gives no textual evidence whatsoever. No, there's none. There's none. Yeah, the textual evidence is absolutely solid. Jesus is prophesying Paracletus. Yeah, there's no exception to that in any of the ancient texts at all. Yeah, there's no basis for it textually. Yeah, it's simply seeking to find where this prophecy is. And they, oh, it must be here. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we need to be very clear about this in, in our in our conversation with Muslims because it is a uh, it's a great it's a um, yeah, it is. An, Muslims say, don't corrupt the scriptures. And so we say, then don't corrupt them. <laughs> don't change this. It is Paracletus. We plead with you. Take that seriously. Yes, yes. Will we, they get angry of us because they say you, that you mustn't corrupt the scripture? I'm just saying don't corrupt it. I don't charge them with corrupting, but I says don't do it. <laughs> just beg them, don't do it. Yeah. Likewise, they say to us, don't corrupt the scriptures. We agree, we should not do that. We say the same to them, don't, don't do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, our time has come to conclude this session. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.